Welcome back to the Spectre Creative Channel. I'm Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, former brand manager of Masters of the Universe, and today I'm doing a video about the Masters of the Universe movie. And more importantly, where is this movie? We keep being told it's coming. It's like every couple of years we uh, we're given a new announcement that the movie is coming on this date, and then it kind of gets pushed back. I obviously uh, have a little bit of an inside knowledge of this, having reviewed, I don't want to say countless Masters of the Universe scripts over the years, but being fortunate to have worked at Mattel between uh, 2005 and 2014, and being in charge of the Masters of the Universe Classics line, which was aimed at the adult collector, not at kids, it was not at retail, it was only available online, and that definitely put me in prominence as far as someone at the company who knew a lot about the brand. And I was often brought in to meetings to discuss the scripts, and occasionally I would be given copies of them to read and even provide notes on, which I was thrilled to do. And it was definitely, you know, kind of a fan dream come true, if you will. Sort of what makes me unique in the uh, toy industry is that I'm, I've worked in it, but I'm also a fan. And that definitely, uh, that passion was kind of what gave me that privilege to take a look at these. So why aren't these scripts getting made? They've, they've got all these awesome scripts and Sony is so excited about the film. So with all of this momentum behind it and a major Fortune 500 company pushing, you know, uh, Mattel behind it as well. So you've got, you know, a toy producer and a, a studio. It seems like this should be an automatic formula, right? To make an amazing movie. I mean, we, we keep hearing about even casting announcements in addition to release dates. We, we've gone through a couple director announcements. There seems to be so much positive momentum and so many people who want to see this film made. What in the world is holding it up? Well, this is not a video of me, you know, talking about confidential information with either Sony or Mattel. I definitely, even though I don't no longer work for Mattel, I would never do that. But what I can offer is just some general insight about the property and the film industry. And namely, this would be a big, big movie. It's definitely envisioned as a major blockbuster, you know, a huge summer CGI awesome movie. And that means there's going to be a price tag. What you're looking at here is actually $200 million. Like that's actually, you know, because I Googled $200 million and found a picture of it. That's how I know how much it is. I don't actually, you know, have that lying around. If I did, I probably would be uh, doing a lot more with my life. Well, either way, the point is, that's what it's going to cost to make your giant summer blockbuster. I mean, any summer blockbuster. I'm not just talking about Masters of the Universe. This applies to really anything, any, you know, huge property that's going to have special effects and creatures and what's called world building, meaning you're creating a whole universe to live in, not just, you know, one guy living in a cabin or, you know, one spaceship where you just have to build some corridors and a cockpit. You know, you actually have to go around the whole world. And that's going to include costumes, and it's going to include weapons and, and you know, creatures, and, you know, both creatures as far as, like, you know, giant monsters to battle, and, you know, if you will, characters like, you know, Buzz Off or Clawful that, you know, would need some form of special effect, whether it's done with a mask or CGI, they're, they're not necessarily fully human and would obviously need some uh, above and beyond special effects or costuming prosthetics to make them come alive and, you know, for movie audiences, as well as obviously, you know, things like Battle Cat, you know, you, you're not exactly going to be able to train a real tiger to do this. Battle Cat would probably have to be done as a combination of CGI and puppetry, kind of like the original Jurassic Park, which oddly had way less CGI than people give it credit for, but that's not what this YouTube video is about. All right, so you're all going to say, well, wait a minute, there was a He-Man movie that came out in 1987, and I love this movie. It starred Dolph Lundgren, and it had that chick from Friends in it, and the little, uh, you know, uh, dwarfy guy who, who, who ran around talking to cows and stuff. Why in the world, you know, if they could make this in 1987, why can't they just make this now? Well, let's just take a quick look at the movie and, you know, what, what was in it. There was basically one key scene 
on Eternia, namely Skeletor's throne room. Well, actually, it was Castle Grayskull's throne room that Skeletor took over, and a lot of the budget went into this. The rest of the movie took place on a planet you may be more familiar with. It's called Earth. You know, it means dirt. And it was a lot less expensive to make a movie where He-Man is hanging out in record shops and high school gymnasiums versus running around, you know, in the, you know, corridors of Lithos and, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, Desert of Fire and, you know, all the, the cool things on Eternia. Having the characters on Earth was essentially a way to do a Masters of the Universe story and keep it on budget. I mean, Gwildor was done because Orko would have been too expensive. They didn't have a way of doing Orko. A movie like this image, you know, with He-Man, like literally the toys coming alive and, you know, battling on Eternia, we're talking about a huge price tag. And while, yes, they spend this amount of money on movies all the time, for the most part, they're proven properties that get budgets like this. Things like Star Wars or Batman that have a a history of successful films. And the the other reason it's so expensive is, you know, this is an image of Avatar. You have if you're gonna create Eternia, which is a fantasy world, again, that money needs to be on screen. You need to spend a lot of money to make that world. You can't just shoot He-Man in a gymnasium or driving around in a pink Cadillac. You need to have all sorts of creatures and you know special effects that you know dominate a whole world, not just one small set like they did in the 87 movie with the throne room of Castle Grayskull, which was more or less the only Eternia scenes. I mean, there were some running around, you know, canyons and stuff like that. You know, and obviously, you know, giant special effects, you know, Prince Adam becoming He-Man and saying, I have the power, the lightning and all the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's not just something you can do with strobe lights, right? We have to make, if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. I mean, we, you know, I mean, the royal we, the hypothetical we. So, yes, there's your $200 million right there, your budget for the film, doing all of that because you have to do it in a world. You have to create a world like Star Wars or Avatar or, you know, things like, or Wakanda. I mean, anything where it takes place. I mean, yes, I know Wakanda's on Earth, but more or less it's it's a whole world in there in Wakanda. Um, boy, social justice warriors are going to have me on this one. All right. So what's the other half of the puzzle? Why is, you know, okay, so it's only $200 million. Well, yeah, that's the shooting budget. You also have a promotions budget. And while traditionally, well, usually the promotion budget for a major summer blockbuster is about, I mean, it's more or less usually double the production cost. But especially for a movie like Masters, it's going to be another $200 million. Hey, I got to use this image twice. Maybe I just really love money. Well. Anyway, so more or less, you're spending $200 million on shooting the movie and then another $200 million promoting the movie. Now, why do you have to spend so much money promoting this movie? I mean, you know, all of us He-Fans and She-Ravers out there are saying the movie sells itself. I mean, you got He-Man and Skeletor and, and Tila and Beast-Man, right? You do it right, and it's just going to sell itself. Well, yeah, we're all huge, passionate fans. The casual moviegoer basically doesn't know all these characters. They might recognize Man-at-Arms and Tila, but they don't have a knowledge of really anyone outside the main characters. I mean, you know, there are people that will recognize Skeletor, but there's a lot more that won't. So the marketing budget is not just about promoting the movie, but it's about re-educating the public about this 80s brand that, for the most part, most people remember the Filmation series. That's kind of the, uh, you know, the cognitive scheme of the public awareness of this property. It's, in a way, as super fans, it's hard for us to, I wouldn't say acknowledge this, realize this, you know, that most people, when they think of He-Man, just think of this. Think of, you know, He-Man and Skeletor as action figures in the 80s, or, you know, again, the Filmation series. Because for us, He-Man is so important, and we're so emotionally involved in it. We love it so much. We spend tons of money on collectibles. For the casual moviegoer, person, you know, you know, called in the flyover states, if you will, I mean, which I now live in one of those, I no longer live in Los Angeles, their idea of what He-Man is and their memories 
you know, he's not the be all end all of their world the way it is for us. And I'm including me in that. So a huge marketing campaign is needed to not only promote the film, but to educate the public, remind them about this property that, you know, it's a huge, you know, known toy world. And, you know, it's been around for, you know, 38, 40 years. It's, it's a major spend, no matter what, without spending a huge amount on marketing. And it's not just billboards. I'm just using these as an example for a visual of a movie promotion. There's all sorts of clever ways movies are promoted these days. And yes, you can do things, you know, less expensive online, but come on, let's be realistic. You're going to need to spend half a million dollars to make this movie happen. 200 million to shoot it, 200 million to promote it, you know, more or less another million, another hundred million thrown in there and you basically, you know, have $500 million. I'm sorry, half a billion. So yeah, 500 million. And that's completely in line with other major studio projects. You know, superheroes and space fantasies. That's the budget they're getting. I mean, the original Iron Man, the budget was $140 million, And this was, what, you know, 2008 money. So, you know, over 10 years ago. Versus fast forwarding to the latest Avengers, and it's $356 million. And this is just the production cost. This isn't even promotions. Promotions is basically another $200 million. You know, G.I. Joe, to show a comparable toy property was $175 million. If Motu could be made for $175 million, if you could get this on screen for $175 million and promote it for, you know, just say $50 million, yeah, movie's fast track, movie happens. But because of the huge investment, because it's basically more or less $500 million, half a billion dollars just to make the movie and promote it, that's the guarantee that that's why I think there's hesitancy to jump full in. It's an unknown property for the most part, outside of, you know, the, the passionate collectors. And it's, you know, it's tough. It's a tough, uh, you know, pill to swallow that much money for a property that hasn't had a successful movie. I mean, outside of the 87 movie. I hope this clarified. I'm obviously excited for a movie. I'd love to see one. In no way am I trying to, you know, be a downer that a movie's not happening. I'm just trying to provide a little framework especially because I definitely have an interesting, unique perspective. If you like these videos, leave a comment below, subscribe, and I'll uh, see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.